think of the uh, danger of them falling into some small group like Hamas, which kind of goes for the whole glorified... Uh, I am much topic. more frightened of them being under the control of the White House. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. <laughs> That's an original thought. That's all you're saying. Sure. So uh, you just made a, me uh, a reference to the, uh, the long emergency uh, by Kunstler. Uh, he also does a blog every week that's amazingly depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on peak oil um, and, and Kunstler maybe, because if I keep reading him, I'll just have to kill myself. <laughs> no, don't do that. Um, Hey, a super smart guy. I, I would love to have the privilege of knowing him personally. Um, what really troubles me, I mean, I, I was educated in the 70s, and there was some very good work done in the 70s. The Limits to Growth by the Meadows and Jorgen Randers, who people forget was one of the co-authors. Uh, he actually came and spoke at Muhlenberg. And um, uh, Richard Falk did a lot of good stuff. Barnett did the book on multinationals, Global Reach. Um, and what I find these days with the authors that I'm reviewing is that they're reinventing old knowledge. Um, the people who were educated in the 90s haven't read the books that were written in the 70s. Gene and Jacobs. what's that? Gene Jacobs. Who's Gene Jacobs? Jane, Jane, Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs. Uh, what about Jane Jacobs? I'm just saying. Uh, cities, communities. <clears throat> or Paul Goodman, uh, Communitas. Um, we've really lost the ability to do literature research, and, and, and the internet, for all of its glorious joys, um, has, has really kind of changed scholarship. Uh, I mean, Wikipedia has its pluses and its minuses. Uh, you know, I gave up on the open source intelligence page because I just had too many morons uh, trying to push an agenda. Um, but on the other hand, some Wikipedia pages are absolutely a thing of joy, and, and Nature did a comparison of Wikipedia with the uh, Britannic Encyclopedia and Wikipedia One. Uh, that's pretty cool, because that's the power of collective intelligence. The problem is I, I've decided that uh, Wikipedia would be better served if anyone can create, but only masters can destroy, because we've got too many morons with editing privileges. Um, and, and so that's holding Wikipedia back. Um, and I have once again lost my chain of time. I'm, I'm going to have to gong you guys. Uh, sorry, sorry the, the question. Uh, yeah. The question was about Kunstler and. and oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, okay, I love them. And, and, and the point that I'm making, the point that I started out to make before I lost my mind, uh, is that we've known all this shit for 40 years. I mean, there is no question, and CIA did some very good work in the 1970s on AIDS and pandemics and infectious diseases and water and the whole bit. And, and it was against the CIA culture to do that because it didn't have any secrets. You, you didn't have to steal shit on AIDS. Um, and the White House and the Congress deliberately ignored it. I mean, the Senate had hearings on peak oil from 1974 to 1979. And, you know, we went through that gas guzzler thing and, and small cars were in vogue and then we snapped right back and started pumping out big SUVs and we, we lack integrity in defining a truck as a car and a car as a truck. Um, so I think although the long emergency is absolutely credible, I think that we should not underestimate the genius of the human mind. And we should not underestimate the exponential capability of the human mind when it learns to talk to each other. Um, and I think we should not underestimate the speed with which we can learn from and apply biomimicry and, and other principles of sustainable design. Um, and it may even come that it's like this massive global meme. You know, they talk about the monkeys in one side of the earth learning how to wash nuts and all of a sudden all monkeys everywhere can wash nuts. You know, I, I, I take a lot of that stuff seriously. I think there is a newosphere. Uh, and I think at some point we might become collectively intelligent. Right now it's just us. Uh, but uh, eventually I think it'll, it'll spread. So I am not an optimist. And in fact, as I was inscribing the, the new book for many people, I, I, most people I said, and, and I have high hope for our shared future. Um, if anything, this is an opportunity. 
in my opinion. Uh, I mean, there's, it's, it's easy to kill yourself, but I like to say, you know, a dead daddy is, or a live daddy without a job is better than a dead daddy. And so on balance, I think we should keep every person alive that we can. Uh, go on, sir. Hey, uh, okay. Um, what's your opinion on um, China and its relation with Google and the entire thing? Because I mean, Google obviously pulled. Out, obviously, when Google pulled out, there were financial reasons for that uh, helped them make that decision. I won't say it made it. It led them to the decision, but it, it certainly had to give them some help. In the it's a very interesting conflict between two different worlds. I mean, one of the things China may not realize is that Google can make China disappear. Um, in cyberspace, and that's a lot of power. Um, and that's power I don't want Google to have. Uh, at the same time, you have to, or you don't know this, but, but I finished high school in Singapore, and minister mentor Lee Kuan Yew, whose English name is Harry, and who was once called the best Englishman in Asia uh, by a uh, visiting British uh, Earl or whatever, um, he has spoken about demography, not democracy. And one of the things people don't realize is just how tough China is to manage. I mean, it's got over 300 water stress cities, and it's got some really big issues on energy and, and all kinds of things. And right now, I think the last thing that China needs is democracy, especially our kind of democracy. Um, and so I, I vote for giving authoritarian governments latitude, particularly if they're making sensible things. I mean, China now has a stock market. They just did an IPO that is the largest in the world. Um, on balance, I have learned over time to really respect the Chinese. I mean, I don't know if it's true or not, but from one of the French prime ministers was asked what he thought about the outcome of the French Revolution, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, he said it's too soon to tell. Uh, that's a very cool perspective, and I will point out that the Native Americans like to do what they call seven-generation thinking, all right? So I think we're at the end of the first seven generations and at the beginning of the second seven generations. And on balance, I'm optimistic. On balance, I'm quite certain that Brazil, China, Indonesia, Iran, Russia, and Venezuela are going to be major world players for the next 30 years. and. There is not a damn thing we can do about their power, but we can do something about passing on lessons that we may have been unwilling to learn, but that we now must uh, kind of articulate and communicate. Y'all tired? Have I worn you out? No, not even close. I'll stay here until there's no one else in the room. <laughs> if no one else is going to get up. <laughs> All right. All right, we got this guy. Cool. Um, you know, I tell you what, I, I, I came back at my own expense from Guatemala from this. The UN does not know I'm here. Actually, they do. I, I got permission from my boss. I told him, and, and he said, well, steal what you can. And I didn't explain to him that it wasn't like that. Um, but uh, you guys really charge me up. Uh, this is this is my play date. <laughs> well, you know, I've been thinking about North Korea and all these dysfunctional and corrupted organizations, and I was thinking a practical way to solve that kind of organization. I was I was wondering how an honest person if it would be possible, even if he has all the power, like the President of the United States, even if Obama was honest, if the whole organization was corrupted, would, wouldn't, would that actually affect that honest person in the government? I, 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 was, I was also imagining like a, uh, a gang of bikers, you know, and the leader becoming weak. They're gonna, they're gonna end up killing him. Mm -hmm. So is actually Kim Jong Il, you know, uh, free of doing whatever he wants, or he's actually a slave of his own organization? 
I, I, I find all of that very provocative, and I don't know, so I can't really comment on North Korea, but one thing that I've observed with great interest is the, uh, the encroachment of cell phones into North Korea. Um, and one of our 24 or 25 members that created the Earth Intelligence Network talked about how the cell phone has reduced the resistance, the arm resistance, stuff I don't understand, to zero. Um, and, and frankly, North Korea, you know, I just, I just have to marvel at the idiocy of the U.S. government. Uh, the, the ideological imperatives that cause us to leave so many troops as a tripwire in South Korea and to, to basically try and punish North Korea and Cuba. Uh, you know, there are two sustainable agricultural models in the world. One is the Amish and the other is the Cuban. I mean, we force them to not do bad shit by embargoing all the bad shit. Oh, clever us. Uh, you know, so I, 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 I think that this whole idea of surrender with kindness is very powerful. Uh, this book that I reviewed, which will be released on the last day of August, talked about this one man that would walk through Afghan villages with a red bucket and hand stuff out and in, in the perfect language, what's that? I can't read it. That's not, that can't take five minutes. Come on. The sun rises in 45 minutes. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> I absolutely have to leave by 10, but, uh, but I'm good until then. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it, but the record, I think, is four hours. Uh, so anything over four hours, oh, we just passed the record, I think. 20 yeah, minutes. yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, it's a, uh, all right, I, I'm, I'm still going. Um, so, uh, I, you know, it, oh, Red Bucket, thank you, thank you, thank you. See, the collective mind is good. Uh, I need you. Um, and, and, and he would walk into this one village. It was a very powerful book. And he'd walk into this one village, and this old guy would be at the other side muttering about, oh, they're trying to convert us to Christianity and all this jazz. And so he'd walk up to the old guy, and he'd hand him a copy of the new constitution of Afghanistan in his language. And he explained it to him in a few words. And he said for the rest of the day, the guy followed him around like he was the Messiah. I, we suck at communicating. And I'm just shocked at the, 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 the childish, stupid, wasteful crap we call public diplomacy uh, and human terrain teams and PSYOP, you know? It's just nuts. All we got to do is deal in the truth and keep our integrity and, and everybody wins. Um, but we don't seem to have figured that out. Yes, sir. But uh, my question was more about if our leaders are actually powerful, if they actually have the power. All right, let me, yes, let me, let me come back to that. I don't think many people know, but Khrushchev and Kennedy had a back channel during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And both of them were having trouble with their generals who wanted to nuke each other. And the real hero of the Cuban military crisis was the Soviet submarine commander who refused a direct order to fire a torpedo at a U.S. Navy ship. Okay? And, I mean, I, I think history is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, uh, John Lewis Gaddis has written a book called The Landscape of History. And the whole bottom line of that book, and the CIA people hate my review of it, uh, is that history is a denied area for us because we've chosen to be ignorant of history. Uh, we've particularly chosen to be ignorant of history written in other languages. Uh, I mean, this is the most naive, clueless society I've ever seen. Someone in South Africa on the street knows more American history than we know about any country in Africa. Period. There's just something wrong with that. So I think the leaders have more power than they believe, and I think they're also more timid than they need to be. I could save Obama's ass from this point forward, but I can't get to him. Yes, sir. 
being an optimist, I, I like focusing on uh, folks who are doing it well. Um, and I don't really take much news in, but I did uh, hear something um, about the World Peace Index uh, done this year and about New Zealand. Uh, and I'm curious if you have any insights into certain things that they have done um, being marked as the number one. Um, most They're an island country. that kills Samoans on arrival. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, that's really too flip. Um, well, I, I understand but they are an island, and the men love the sheep, and the sheep love the men. And they really, actually, they're having big, they're, they're having big crime issues uh, because the Samoans are, are experimenting with being gangs. Um, and that's a problem because Samoans are really big and really bad. So is the uh, World Peace Index just a crock of shit then? No, no, no. I think the World Peace Index is very good. It's, it's, it's one side of it. But if you really want to do a World Peace Index, try addressing all the battered women. Try addressing all the people in the United States who live behind uh, grills, who are prisoners in their own home. Um, the bottom line is, and I, I mean, I've built four or five strategic analytic models in my lifetime. Uh, it's a good peace index. It's certainly worthy, but it isn't anywhere near the whole picture. Now, it certainly helps that New Zealand is an island really far from everything. Uh, and one of the cool things to look at is, is the world in the Buckminster Fuller sphere, the Fuller projection, I think it's called. It's on my website. Um, because what you see is that the entire South American and African landmass is a red zone of really screwed up places. And the only two green places, actually the green places in the North Pole, okay, Iceland is the next boom town. There's 600,000 people there, and they are going to mine the gold of global warming. Uh, what's that? Well, yeah, well, not really, but they also just declared independence from Denmark, and Denmark let them do it. Um, and so I think we're going to have a Northwest Passage, and we're going to see some real interesting stuff. And if I were the Northwest uh, Territory and Yukon, I'd be telling Canada to fuck off real soon. Um, because that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and then down in the south, Australia is actually poised to become the hub of the southern sphere, the real southern sphere. How so? Well, New Zealand, Australia, and the Antarctic. Um, and, and there's just some really fascinating stuff happening. And then this red crescent from where I sit is desperately in need of a Marshall Plan. And our problem is that we've been too busy concentrating wealth and, and concentrating wealth very badly. I mean, America has, has the, the top 1%. Uh, you know, I mean, our, our wages are now back to pre-1960s levels. Um, we've lost all the ground we've gained in the last 50 years. Um, labor unions are dead. We've spent 30 years exporting jobs. Uh, we've killed the... the the blue collar class, we've killed half of the white collar class. Um, so the peace index is useful, but the strategic analytic model is more useful um, because- well, I, don't want, I don't want to get lost on the peace index. I guess what, I was, uh, what had drawn me to it was uh, some of the notes of uh, New Zealand's disarmament, which sounds like that's a pile of shit. Um, do you know anyone else who is leading uh, disarmament of the, of the military regimes and, and just the power that that holds? Well, Costa Rica. Um, uh, Singapore is doing very well with its small military. They're emphasizing naval interdiction and command and control and intelligence. Uh, rumor has it that Admiral Poindexter is hiding there um, and that total information awareness was exported to Singapore. That's also where all the American scientists go to do cloning and all that other stuff. Uh, Singapore actually recruits them from here. Um, How were those movements initiated? Because I, I, I do envision that for ourselves here. I do envision a world. I mean, you say peace is the way, but then you also talk about keeping military. I, I don't see He changed guns. microphones. OK. I, I love you, and I'm not being disrespectful. And you come back as many times as you want. OK. Uh, I think this is like five. Uh, but anyway. Uh, hey, this, very clever. I'm not, I'm not the only one, but I, I mean, if anyone else wants to come up and No, talk no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, and frankly, I mean, you, you've earned the A for today, uh, and, and thank you. Um, Costa Rica has done very well, but see, one of, the problems, one of the problems we're having is that that can backfire. 
because we have spent the last 20 years letting the Colombian and Mexican gangs build up multi-billion dollar war chests. And one of the things we found in Guatemala was we couldn't hire any local polygraphers because they all worked for the druggies. Okay, and we couldn't hire any technical security measures people because they all worked for the druggies. Okay, so we had to import people. Um, and so one of the problems you have is when Mexico has a success, Guatemala and Costa Rica have a problem. And right now, all the, all the drug processing labs have been moved up to Nicaragua, and uh, Guatemala, Patan is now a narco state. Um, and the whole thing goes bad fast, because it used to be that the oligarchs would rent their landing strips and their big fincas for $20,000, and then the uh, druggies started insisting on paying half in cash and half in drugs. And so the whole thing went downhill from there, and so now there's an internal market for drugs in, in Guatemala and elsewhere. Um, and the police got corrupted, and there's no military. The military got demobilized and became the private security industry, which essentially is, is the hidden powers. The, these are the people that kill you if they're angry. Um, is one of those things so I can go pee faster? <laughs> well, I guess not. What? It's not, it's not 10. It's not 10 a.m. yet. What's your fucking problem? You guys run out of electricity or something? <laughs> okay. We love you. We really do. But, you know, it is He's reading from a script. So what's your fucking point? Not saying you. What's your point? Just that. It's been nice talking to you. No. And continue. Can I have a ride to the bathroom? <laughs> I'll pee on your machine. I wasn't going to let you ride with me, but okay. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, is there service in here in terms of ice and like two more cokes, or is ice is all gone? There are a whole bunch of floors here. I'm sure somebody. Can no, 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 no. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm not asking. I'm not asking for that kind of personal service. But go ahead. Go. Go with the mic, and then we'll go over there. Uh, right, I'm, I'm, I just want to change the subject a little bit. Rupert Sheldrake and Morphic Fields. Clueless. Okay. Do you want to say something about it? No, no, no. Just. Well, just repeat it then. So. <laughs> Rupert Sheldrake's a, a biologist. Uh -huh. And he talks about morphic fields. So electricity is a field, magnetism is a field. Oh, absolutely. And, I, yeah. you know, your thoughts, your energy are fields. That's a morphic field. And it comes from biology. That's, that's cool. I mean, I, I'm totally into There's this wonderful book called What the Bleep Do We Know? I mean, it's a DVD. And it, it's very good. It's very good. I absolutely believe in paranormal. Um, uh, you see, they're having too much fun. Um, I would like to see Segway Polo. Has anybody done that? <laughs> That would be really cool. That's Waz. Waz yeah. has done that. Yeah, that is really cool. Okay. Um, no, I, I think we're, I mean, literally, this is almost like the beginning of humanity. Uh, it's like Noah's Ark just puked you guys out, and uh, we're ready to start again. Um, and uh, I'm not sure we should do Hackers Every uh, Hope every, every year, but... Uh, it's entirely up to you guys. I, I'll come back if uh, you lose a certain amount of synergy. And I, I, although I noticed we don't have the Europeans here this year, uh, Rob Gongrich doesn't seem to be around. Um, well, he's probably committed suicide after the Dutch fucked up the soccer final. Uh, but. Uh, it was not rigged. Those assholes fouled too much. You know, I watched that thing because I knew I'd be interrogated when I returned to Guatemala. Uh, the Spanish won that fair and square. The Dutch just cheated themselves out of a victory. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, it really, yeah, they choked on two goals too. Absolutely. Actually, that was a feature. <laughs> All right, so another question? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm just taking a general look around here, but back when I used to be like a little sperm here, we, we had some issues with uh, a place called Cuba, and there was like a little nuclear issues, a little Bay of Pig issues. Um, many, many years ago, um, the U.S., as far as I know, is still one of the few countries, perhaps the only, that still holds a grudge on that respect. Um, you know, for whatever reason, but, but how can the U.S. possibly have a, a high influence on a country like that uh, when everybody else, including, uh, you know, my Canadian friends, can nonchalantly go over there and vacation and have a great exchange and a great time and, a, and kind of a welcome back to the 50s Woo! country. Oh, I love you so much. And in a wonderful military base, which I've, I've God, been somebody to, get that woman's home. name, a hand phone number. Uh, this is really great. Thank you. God bless you. Wow. You know, I'll tell you what, the babe factor here has really been good. I mean, this is the uh, two, four years ago, I loved it that we had hackers carrying babies and we had little hackers and it was just kind of neat. But this year, it's like normal people have shown up. Uh, and, and it's been really remarkable, and I know a third of them are feds, but, uh, you know, at least they're smart enough now to send younger, good-looking babes instead of the guys with, with, I swear to God, this is a true story from 1994 or 1996, two Air Force security guys, shaved heads, white t-shirts, shorts, and I do not make this up, black Corafam shoes, walking in lockstep. This was Air Force undercover. <laughs> <laughs> You're on. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of flashback about five minutes here. Yeah, Cuba, um, right. Cuba, Sorry. thank you. <laughs> In my age, flashbacks are the, as good as so, it gets. So, so the basis is, um, you know, here it is, the U.S. has got a legal embargo against the Cuba, yeah. but, but nobody else really does. Oh, it's worse than that. The, the FBI was threatening people who had charts of Cuba just in case a hurricane blew them ashore. Uh, the, the U.S. government was confiscating boats and airplanes that had charts of Cuba. Okay. How can this still exist? It's like Bill Clinton and his blowjob, because we could. <coughs> I'm serious. Guantanamo is because they're letting us get away with it. I you would know, give them back Guantanamo in a heartbeat. For money? Not even for money. We have so much to make up for. Uh, you know, the, the fastest way to kill communism in Cuba is to, is to let the Miami mafia go back there. Uh, you know? What? Hey, I'll tell you what. There are some really priceless cars down there. I mean, I have a 1964 MGB, which is the last car I could understand, which my wife calls the goddamn little red car. Uh, but it's worth every penny of the $20,000 uh, that I've put into it. And um, no, Cuba, you know, I mean, Cuba, I mean, Castro's fucked up in a lot of ways. Um, and the Cuban people have suffered greatly. But is it worth holding a grudge against? I mean, no, we don't have a grudge. Country. What we have is an ideological Different? cattle prod up our ass. Okay, I mean, really, we're just stupid on Cuba. Uh, they've got some of the best health care in the in the world. They've really done some enormous developments. I mean, I anticipate the day when we're training nurse practitioners who go around in teams. You know, like there are ten of them equals one doctor. Only each of them is really, really good in one area. And they do surgery, and we're doing tele-surgery and the whole bit. I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface on what we can do. So bottom line on Cuba for me is get over it, but we've got to elect a government with a brain first. Uh, and that's really hard. Uh, there are too many things that are controlled by the multinational corporations and the banks, and sugar subsidies is one of them. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just a real mess. And so I guess my bottom line is let the truth come out and eventually it'll percolate. But you're absolutely right. We should not be embargoing Cuba. We should not be pissing off Hugo Chavez. We should be <laughs> sucking up to him and using his money to make uh, good things uh, happen in Latin America. So, so when Castro finally kicks a bucket for perhaps, you know, the second or third times we've thought that so, um, what do you envision will happen? Will somebody, eventually the light switch will go on and they'll say, hey, guess what, we have a new person in power, maybe we can court them 
and bed well, them? Well, we, we were all very worried. When I was in CIA, we considered Raul Castro a, a raving lunatic, lunatic with a melogamania, pro, uh, however that word's pronounced. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but I think he's become kinder and gentler in his old age. Uh, they're starting to release political prisoners. They're starting to make every possible move to make things better with us, and we're not responding. Um, I mean, I personally am stunned that the U.S. State Department uh, and the White House is, is continuing to be stupid about dictators worldwide. It's called Miami. Uh, it's, well, it's you know, I actually, you, you make a very good point there. There are some Cuban exiles that need to have their visas revoked. Uh, actually, I think there are a lot of citizens who need to have their citizenship revoked. Uh, we have just blown it. Um, and, and one of the problems we've done is, I mean, it's like a repeat of the Nazi problem. We let all the nutcases in, and then they form a little mafia, and they make a little money, and they buy their congressmen, you know. And, I mean, one of the problems Islamics have in the United States is there are like 43 Jewish congressmen and one Muslim. Uh, you know, they haven't figured out that giving to bin Laden does not give them as much as giving to Congress. And, and so when they do figure it out, we'll have more Muslims in Congress. Um, so I, I, I love Cuba. It's got beautiful beaches. I dream of the day when I can go see Air, uh, Hemingway's house there, which they've really kept up. Uh, yeah, really? Oh, that's great. I, I, want to, I want to visit there. Come to Canada, then we'll take you over there. No, I've got a Mexican connection, too. Uh, but no, I, um, I'm a law-abiding citizen who, who uh, does the best he can. So any more comments? I think you all look kind of worn out. Go to bed. Oh. All right. What? What? What did he say? All right. Yeah, you have to go to a mic. Uh, but you who are at the mic, go ahead. I was going to ask, uh, what's up with the sociologists uh, and the uh, anthropologists? I mean, the, the anthropologists, uh, a couple, a bunch of years back with Afghanistan, I thought I was. was they could have done a lot of help with trying to uh, change some of the military people from the inside, particularly since the military actually came to them and started trying to recruit them. Right. But it was the Anthropology Institute of America who pretty much said any anthropologist at all who goes to help the military or advise on any issue regarding Afghanistan and Iraq will immediately lose their license. You're getting me so excited I'm going to have to pee again, but let me answer the question first. Um, number one, I've reviewed a couple of very good books on anthropology and public policy. And one of the problems that we have is that anthropology the ethics of anthropology is to actually understand the other people in order to engage them in a constructive manner. And the military, the military wants to use the anthropologist to lie to people, to understand how to lie to them better. And the most fucked up program in the year, and I've done this, this uh, monograph on human intelligence, and one of the 15 slices is the human terrain teams. And that is apparently the most fucked up unethical program in the US government as far as using humans. And they're sending in unqualified people who are going in looking like Darth Vader, uh, saying, I'm here to help you. You know, and, and I mean, and they're stupid to begin with. They're not anthropologists. They're just someone who happens to need a job and said, oh yeah, I'm an anthropologist and I speak Farsi at the minus six level, you know, or, or Pashtun or whatever. Uh, yeah, and, and so again, it's a money scam. And, and unfortunately, these people are not only getting killed, they're getting other people killed. Anthropology is probably the single most precious uh, field of study right this minute uh, for the United States and for other countries, and we're blowing it. Um, so is there any way that we can convince or like, you know, drop the hint to the military, hire these people? They, they specialize in what you want to do? I, I have I already told you guys about the Somali thing? I did the Somali piracy study in um, 2005 for the U.S. Central Command. I was, I, it was really good. That was one of my high years, 1.7 million. And um, I studied Somali piracy. I said, we got to go in there and we've got to contain this. And uh, nothing happened. And a couple of years later, I had a chance to talk to both the U.S. Navy irregular warfare guys and the special operations uh, hunter-killer teams. And I said, why haven't you guys taken care of the Somali problem? And the answer from both was almost identical. It's not an expensive enough problem. Okay? Now, Navy irregular warfare right now is spending all of its time trying to figure out what kind of shit it can fit into the five-foot 
wide torpedo tubes of an SSGN so that the Navy can justify nuclear SSGNs as irregular warfare assets. It doesn't get any dumber than that. Uh, so the problem is not getting anthropologists to be picked up by the military. The problem is getting a military that actually wants to do something uh, with anthropologists. Please let me take a short break, um, and I will be right back. And I'm quite serious about staying here until 10 o'clock. <laughs> but you won't make it. When your own government refuses to hire you, you guys are the next best thing. Uh, We're not paying enough. It's again, Robert Steele. No, that's true, but, but uh, I just reviewed a book called The Hidden Wealth of Nations, and it's written by a very smart guy who was a strategy advisor to uh, Blair. And he talks about intangible wealth, and getting along and sharing information is a huge, huge wealth creator. Uh, and we're not good at that. Uh, we've really messed up our suburbs and our cities, and we've lost community. I mean, Paul Goodman's Communitas is still a very, very good read. Uh, so let's go here in front, and then we'll come to you, sir. Your strong opinions about bored billionaire uh, mayors in the city of New York? Hmm. I think Bloomberg can be saved. Um, I really, I read Bloomberg on Bloomberg. It's a very good book. The man is a very smart businessman. He's a very stupid politician. Um, he lucked out with Jackie Salick and the independent movement. They gave him that election. And he betrayed them by insisting on a third term. Now, I won't hold that against him. But I watched Bloomberg make an ass of himself in Oklahoma. Um, he appeared in the so-called bipartisan panel with David Boren and of all the people there, the only two that were still alive were, were um, Bloomberg and Sam Nunn, okay? You had Cohen, um, you had Senator Graham, you had other losers I can't even remember. And Bloomberg had no idea that everybody in the audience understood that this was the two-party tyranny making a mockery of any possibility of his being a president. And had he had half a brain, he would have actually done what I suggested, because he did send me a thank you note, uh, and then blew me off. Uh, I sent him a binder. I said, you need a coalition sunshine cabinet while you are mayor of New York to demonstrate that you can create a balanced budget for the government of the United States with sensible policies across these 12 areas. It doesn't get any simple. I handed him a fucking country on a plate, and he didn't want it. Uh, so if anybody here is sleeping with Bloomberg or talking to him. Uh, Robert Steele still loves him, and uh, he can be president, but he's going to have to think some new thoughts. Yes, sir. In the back, yeah. Oh, shoot, I'm starting to fade out. I wonder if I, if I may formulate this question, but okay, here we go. I'm going to give it a try. Um, so, as I'm told, the Department of Defense is the biggest funder of basic research in computer science and mathematics. Yes. Which is strange but true. Um, so I think the question was supposed to go something like this. Um, now, on the one hand, that kind of research produces highly fragmented results. Right. But it tends and to be classified. It, yeah, and classified, so nobody gets to read them half right. the time. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Right, most um, of them. So, so then the question becomes um, do you think in a decentralized model you can still produce those kinds of deep results, and do you think you can do it without? Um, without everyone having to squabble for patronage from, you know, the cash cow that's the Department of Defense, mm. especially in academia, um, especially in academia. Yeah. Um, Chuck Spinney's a good friend of mine, and, and we had lunch a November or two ago, and, and Chuck told me something that has been burned in my brain. He said the Department of Defense has caused the United States of America to raise an entire generation of engineers who know nothing other than government spec cost plus, which is about the dumbest ass way to ever build anything, uh, particularly since about 1986, the government forgot how to do functional requirements analysis and statements of work. 
And so they hire contractors to do the statements of work. And of course, the contractors write statements of work that demand that the government buy everything they can't sell to anyone else, okay, including all the people who are on overhead and need to be on direct. Um, I think also that while DOD has done some really excellent things, across the board, the United States has become a culture of cheaters. There's actually a book called A Culture of Cheating. And universities have sold out. They've commercialized. Um, tenure has been abused. Uh, the students are skating by, not actually being forced to produce anything intelligent. Um, <laughs> Actually, I have a boss that needs an undergraduate degree, uh, but it has to stand up to scrutiny. Uh, what, work the FedEx machine? Huh? Work the photocopier? Ooh. <laughs> 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 it gives you one for a hundred bucks. <laughs> what? He's saying I can only speak for 50 more minutes? You're good till 9.30. Says who? Do you hate the uh, truth? Huh? Emmanuel or? He's a dude. I don't. I don't give a shit about that. I mean, if the hotel is saying that for fire reasons we have to close this. Well, then I think they have to close Radio Statler, don't they? No, I think we're open. Is this? Uh, why don't you bring this to Emmanuel's attention because he knows we're going for a six-hour record. And the six hours is in uh, 45, 45 minutes. Okay. Um, all right, we're good. We're good. Um, so where were we? Are we keeping anyone awake? No. We want to be awake. Who? Okay. I mean, I don't think we're bothering anybody. All right, so go on. I mean, I'll stop when I'm ordered to stop, but the only guy here that outranks me is Emmanuel. Uh, so, yeah. And also, he gave me permission, I think, to go with the six-hour thing. If you guys read in the book, it says we're going for six hours. So. We think we can do eight. Six is good, but eight I can live Ten with. Ten o'clock. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the areas here have been kind of like shades of gray, but I, I wanted to ask your opinion of, of first of all, uh, President Obama as being a half African American and, and how that plays into the fact that um, that's worked him into the presidency and perhaps it's given some immunity um, politically uh, for whatever he's done wrong or hasn't done perhaps, uh, BP. And, and how that kind of plays into thing and, and how that may play into things in the future of having, you know, the unforbidden, you know, we can't talk about well, that. Well, he's, no, he's, he's conflicted. Uh, I love the black half of Obama. Uh, that's the half, that's, no, I'm serious. That's respectable, I, really. I've, I've thought about him a lot um, uh, because I, I really felt that he could have been a change agent, but he sold out. Um, and he also didn't have anyone he could trust near him that would tell him that the dumbest thing he could do was put Rahm Emanuel in the White House. Um, you know, so, so, I mean, he basically, and, and he's got General Jones, who's the most senior clerk in the U.S. government, okay? Uh, Jones has confused loyalty with integrity and staff work with thinking, and, and these guys are absolutely worthless in terms of actually helping Obama be a great president. Um, but Obama is basically counting the days to when he can join Bill Bradley at Allen and Company. Uh, so he's sold out for money and he doesn't give a shit about us. But his black half is the half that had one authentic moment. And that's when he said he could no more renounce Reverend Wright than he could renounce his own mother. That was a moment of deep, deep integrity. And he gave it up. His white half is so fucked up, I'm ashamed of him. But didn't he turn on that guy later? 
And when I mean when when Reverend yes, he got did. He turned on extreme. him later. He turned on him later. But one of the things people don't realize is Reverend Wright was quoting a U.S. ambassador. And the reality is, the United States has done some really terrible things in our name. I mean, there's a list of over 200 things that we've done, incursions and so forth. And oh, by the way, we stopped asking Congress for permission to war 200 wars ago. Okay. I mean, the U.S. government is out of control. Congress has given up its integrity. I think every single senator and every single congressman should be put on the street for the next uh, three election cycles so we can churn the Senate. Can you elaborate more on Ron Emanuel? Why was the wrong choice? He's a vicious, unethical little motherfucker. That's it? I think that's enough. All right. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I missed a good chunk of the first part of your uh, talk, so, so I apologize in advance if I'm repeating. That's no, okay. I'll, 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 I'll bring you up to date. It'll um, take about an hour and a half. Okay. Uh, <laughs> are, are you familiar with a book called, uh, I think it was called The Economic Hitman? Oh, yeah, I love it. Um, it's 80% accurate. I don't think he worked for NSA. Uh, NSA doesn't do shit like that. Um, I, I, I think that there, there are portions of the book that I consider highly questionable, but I gave it a very strong review. Um, and in fact, where he's most credible is on things like corporations using fraudulent religious organizations to go in and basically poison a village or, or get a village to move off a mountain. The other thing that people do is they pay a Peruvian colonel a million dollars to have his battalion move a village off a mountain and then a Canadian company comes in and takes all the gold out and pays no, no significant export tax. I mean, we've been looting the third world for, for over a century. Um, and, and that's one of the things that kills me because there is plenty of wealth on this planet for everybody. Um, and there's, there's one guy that walks around saying that we really need to have a guaranteed income for everybody. and, and Although I think the Lord's Prayer is one of the most oversold, incoherent prayers I've ever heard, it seems to work for a lot of people. And in there it talks about daily bread. Um, and there's no question in my mind that if people have dignity and food, they're not going to kill each other. Uh, and so we're... Tribute. Yes, yes. And that's, that's where I really emphasize that the human brain is the one inexhaustible resource we have. Um, well, you can have it, you can have it, but, but you have to be content to just look at it on a shelf. Okay, so now, uh, along the lines of that book, I, I, I guess what my question is, is now, is the way the book was laid out where basically these corporations were taking advantage of right. developing countries to get underneath the, the thumb of the World Bank, is that like like an intentional manipulation of the country from the U.S. government side of things, or is it more? No, that's corporate. So it's capitalism just raping and pillaging. Well, yeah, and 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 Richard Barnett wrote the original um, book on this um, called Global Reach in the 1970s, about 1974, and my senior thesis at Muhlenberg was on multinational corporations and home host country issues including things like multiple books, creating subsidiaries so that they could move money, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, what really happened here, and, and, and as I see it, the United States failed to help other governments govern. And as a result, multinational corporations became a new power on the planet. And it was a power that could avoid regulation because we failed to, to internationalize uh, services of common concern and regulations of common good. And then crime came up. And it's very interesting to me, Moises Naim has written a very good book called Illicit. The criminal economy is roughly $2 trillion, almost exactly 50% of which goes to government officials hmm. as corruption. That's government life Uh, try reading the book. Okay, okay so that, uh, one more thing. So now, um, 
it, it seems like that's the culture now where it's based off catal capitalism, where if, if you go back a couple hundred years to the 1800s, it seemed like almost like a hobby for US political officials to either fund or build up armies in South America to overthrow governments. This, I don't necessarily know if that was for fun or profit. Well, read, but... uh, read my review of Tim Weiner's uh, Legacy of Ashes. Um, and there's also several other books on regime change. And Chalmers Johnson has written Sorrows of Empire. Uh, Noam Chomsky, Chomsky has written Because We Say So. I mean, there's a whole bunch of books on this. Uh, what it boils down to is we got very used to Buana diplomacy. And uh, we got very used to being big white man on the, on the block. Uh, and we also got used to being able to overthrow a government with one Navy ship uh, and one, you know, company of Marines. Um, and we followed in the footsteps of the British. Um, there's a wonderful book called Web of uh, Deceit. And basically, we lied to the Arabs and then we betrayed the Arabs. Uh, and... Uh, Again, I go back to Philip Allett's book, The Health of Nations, uh, and I really tried very hard to work on that, on that review because it's, it's a brilliant book that covers multiple literatures and integrates them. Um, we basically imposed artificial boundaries based on Western spheres of influence rather than the realities on the ground. And what those artificial boundaries did was they disturbed centuries of harmonious tribal um, accommodation in relation to resources and uh, sustainability of tribes and villages and so forth. Uh, I think we're, we're at a point now where we can kind of revisit everything we've ever done. Um, and the processing power is there, although we're still not, the US government still doesn't process information. I mean, it's still stovepipes collection and doesn't process information. Uh, so I would be very excited if, um, if we actually did a clean sheet review of, uh, of history and uh, get away from lost history, uh, recover history. Uh, again, I come back to the remark someone made, civilization is about transferring the hard earned lessons of the past so that you don't have to pay for them a second time. Uh, and I think the United States is in a very, very good position to, uh, I think he's going to close this down. Somebody swarm him out of here. No, no. I was, I was asking if you needed more Diet Coke because you looked like you were running low. You know what, Nick? I'm really starting to love you. I liked you before, but now, <laughs> now you're, you're getting to me. You're touching me, okay? <laughs> In a meaningful way. <laughs> I, I, I I'll think tell you what. Um, I think I'm going to wear these guys out by 6 o'clock. So I would say two more Diet Cokes and two glasses of ice, and we'll call it at 6. Uh, but I will stay for another hour with a smaller group if it wants while we have breakfast. Well, well the other thing I was going to say is you're, we've actually got backup staff that will take you through to 10 a.m. if you want to do that. <laughs> He's calling my bluff. He's calling my bluff. Oh, you know. It's like my marriage. <laughs> it just went fucking downhill. <laughs> you need to I, rub I'm, his I'm, head I'm absolutely block. serious. If you want us to get you breakfast, <laughs> coffee, whatever you need. I'm going to go with the flow. Okay. I'm going to go with the flow. Okay, so for, But so, I have promised to cook hamburgers at 3 o'clock. So that's five hours away. Okay. No. You were down there? What? No, 10 is, uh, 10 o'clock is, uh, no, three, what's three minus five? <laughs> no, that would be three yeah. minus five is 10 in the morning, morons. If I have to be in Virginia at three o'clock in the afternoon and it takes five hours to get there, I have to leave here at 10 o'clock, right? Yes. Huh? Oh, yeah, I'm driving. I'm driving. No worries. No, 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 I'll be fine. I mean, if I have to, I mean, I, that's why I want to leave at 6, just in case I have to sleep for a couple of hours someplace. Um, but I'll go with the flow, but I personally think 6 o'clock is probably a good time to, to end. 
It's a new record. We can go for eight next time. Okay. I mean, if, if you got really, eight, that's frightening. I mean, if you really want to push it till ten, I'm sure that we could take up a collection to get you a ticket. All right, Nick, don't Amtrak push it. Home. Right now, I like you. <laughs> no, actually, what I need is a driver because I have to take the car with me. Is that an actual challenge? Because I do, I do have a magic way of making these things happen. Mm. What's that? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Let's go with the flow. Let's let's optimize the thing here. Okay, um, two, two more Diet Cokes. Two more and, Diet Cokes and, and two glasses of ice. That wants to see you here at 10 a.m. Okay, got it, got it. Give him a round of applause for making no, it no, this no, far. No, 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 no. I'm using you shamelessly. Yeah, go on. So, uh, All right, so, you're still on. Okay, so I guess to, to take everything full circle, has it basically gone that, uh, like, it went from Manifest Destiny being like kind of like a, a cultural land grab thing to now it's just purely economical but inherently the same thing? Hmm. Manifest Destiny, I think, was, was a government that was growing and and trying to be a big boy among people who had been big boys for centuries before it. Um, I mean, we were like an adolescent uh, at our first big do. And then corporations, and I think Carnegie and Rockefeller really, really <clears throat> did a lot in this area. Corporations essentially realized that they could both do land grabs and manipulate governments. And so that's when we started to see a decline of government integrity and a rise of uh, corporate uh, influence uh, that ultimately, uh, this again comes back to the true cost meme. Uh, I think, gosh, you guys are cheering me up because the more I think about it, the more I think we're at the very beginning of a really, really cool period of time when thinking will be beneficial. Uh, It could be. Uh, now, that's a good analogy. The fog has been clearing, and, and now we're kind of coming out of the fog and seeing landfall. Um, but I absolutely have confidence that if I can harness five billion brains, there is no power on Earth that can stand up to it. And it will be constructive. What's that? Zombie. Zombie? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. All right. No, listen, I, I, I like having you here because you make me look sane and sober. Uh, <laughs> next, next comment, sir. Okay, I have a question uh, about... Now, I have a question regarding how you would respond, how you would think the, the best possible U.S. response could be to, say, the Darfur genocide. <clears throat> the one that's already over? Yes. Back in, I'm saying the one that's already over. I'm but uh, back in, if, uh, if you were in, if you had somehow had control of what the U.S.'s response should have been at that time. Well, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful book called Shake Hands with the Devil, which is about how the U.N. ordered a Canadian general to not stop the genocide in Rwanda. And he went nuts over it. He eventually recovered. Uh, Canada has very good mental health services uh, for English-speaking Canadians. Um, and, um, uh, well, I love the French, you know. I mean, I, I want to learn French because I really do want to spend the next 20 years working for the UN. What's the source of that, actually? A source of what? The way well, you just said, the uh, UN paying the, the Canada general. Is that, I... No, it's the book, Shake Hands with the, uh, with, uh, the Devil. Okay by the lieutenant general that was in charge of UN forces in Rwanda. He was ordered not to stop the genocide. Um, and the reason he was ordered not to stop the genocide was not because the UN likes genocide, but because the UN did not feel that it was within its mandate. What? They did not have enough forces either. No, but you can kill a few and discourage the others. Um, the bottom line is that the, the UN bureaucracy chose to limit, you know, I mean, this is, this is an ethical question, and it's also an ethical question for 
the person on the ground. At what point do you stop following orders that are unethical? Um, and so I feel for the general, but I myself, although I'm, I'm now 58, and I have absolutely no qualms about dying. I've even thought about tattooing a return address on my back um, because my wife doesn't get the insurance unless the body comes back. Um, but you have, to, you have to decide if you want to live with the rest of your life with, with not taking action. And this is why the man went crazy. He had ultimate cognitive dissonance. That Muslim mayor at Fort Hood was suffering from severe cognitive dissonance. Um, and, and I'm actually sympathetic to the problem that he encountered. Uh, because the industrial era system hasn't gotten a grip on the fact that cultural forces can outweigh training and education and heritage. Um, and so basically we should not be asking Muslims to fight Muslims. Uh, we should be, uh, no, we should not be asking American Muslims to fight foreign Muslims. We should be asking Malaysian, Turkish, and Pakistani Muslims to fight Muslims, okay? Uh, so we're really just clueless on cultural intelligence. Um, so how, how, do you, uh, how do you think that such an issue should be dealt with from, uh, from the U.S. side? I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it is a moral and ethical problem. The, the U.S. at the time, we, did, we do have an all-volunteer army. We do have the resources to handle it. So do we sit by and then say that we should handle through the cultural differences? Well, one of, the, one of the things that's happening that's very interesting. Yeah, that would be great with ICE. Thank you. Um, Nick, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'll tell you what, the man is a saint. I mean, he, he, he's got what he wants later. I'm not worried about it. <laughs> no. What? Does he keep getting arrested? Okay. Um, the U.S. government is not trained, equipped, and organized to be effective, either at home or abroad. It's just a collection of bureaucratic agencies that have grown over time. I mean, the Department of Homeland Security is just, the only thing worse than that is the Department of Defense. Um, and so Darfur is at it's, it's multiple kinds of problems. First off, it's an intelligence failure. It's a warning failure. It's a cultural intelligence failure. It's a true cost estimation failure. Uh, it's a diplomatic failure. It's a, um, it's a political naivete failure. It's a failure of, I mean, you know, when you, when you run a government based on one man winning an election and then appointing his cronies, to key positions and putting 20-somethings and 30-somethings into political appointee positions because they put shoe leather on the street and they don't know a goddamn thing about anything they're being put in charge of. I mean, this is nuts, okay? In Haiti, we had a colonel overruling a 20-something who was shrieking and going hysterical and saying, you don't know what their president wants. She's lucky she's not dead. Uh, um, it, <laughs> We're just, we're just ineffective. Uh, Darfur is the kind of thing that should have an African reaction force that is trained, equipped, and organized to do that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, the situation is so corrupt, Darfur is about natural resources, nothing more, nothing less. And um, so you have to have a legal framework, an intelligence framework, an economic framework, a transportation framework. I mean, one of the things we found in Africa is you can't do intelligence country by country. You have to have a regional intelligence construct. You have to be able to intercept mercenaries as they're coming in from all sides. You have to be able to intercept blood diamonds as they're going out. You have to be able to intercept stolen cars from South Africa that are a major source of income. Uh, uh, the reality is we're like this 900-pound baby in diapers. Uh, who, who is just stumbling around. Uh, this is not an intelligent government. It is a government that, like Bill Clinton says, it, it does what it does because it can. And unfortunately, because it can stems in part from our apathy.
and our unwillingness to hold our government accountable for our constitutional and, and, and moral values. Yes, sir. So with these five billion plus brains on, in the world right now, what's the 50 year or 100 year plans for dealing with extreme population growth? Because if we feed the world, there will just be more and more people. No, but the smarter you get, the fewer babies you have. That's true, but there's a large portion of the world that is currently industrializing and hasn't reached full industrialization. And even the United States, the populations are changing immensely. 50 years, or actually it's much less than that, the, I was just gonna pour this the on majority my head, in the United <laughs> States will be um, Latin in what, 20, 25 years according Thank to the you, census? Nick. Thank you, Wait, please, for, please forgive me. I missed the last 17 sure. words. Uh, I think I, I read something by about 2050, more than 50% of the American population will be Latin as opposed to right now. In California, uh, Caucasians are already a minority. I'm not saying that's a problem at all, but populations are still growing more than a replacement rate. <laughs> Well, one of, one of the problems that we have in the United States, and I've reviewed the book, there's like a National Security Memorandum 2000 on population policy, and somebody went to a lot of trouble to think through the implications of all the demographics, youth, elderly, disabled, foreign, everything. And the United States decided not to have a population policy, just like it decided not to have an industrial policy, because we should be self-sufficient. I mean, right now there is exactly one place on the planet where the torrent of the M1 tank can be welded to the body of the M1 tank. You, you take that out, and we don't have M1 tanks. Not that we really need them, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a fact. There's one rail yard in Cincinnati that is the major place. There's three bridges I can take out. There's one Alaska pipeline, there's the Panama Canal, there's the, uh, I, I really piss off Navy admirals when I talk about the submarine antennas on the golf courses in Maine. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just, there are so many choke points here. Um, I think that number one, we all share the same DNA. Uh, pigmentation is a, um, is a tiny, tiny fraction of who we are, and, and I gotta say, having lived a very privileged existence my whole life, I first encountered dark green Marines in the squad bay when I went through Marine Corps training. And I learned from my drill sergeant, we have dark green Marines and we have light green Marines, but we're all Marines. And same thing with us, we're all human. Um, and in fact, certain select human offshoots have different kinds of uh, sensing systems and thinking systems and, and so forth. I don't think population is gonna be a problem. In, in the ideal world, we would get to the point where we have a balanced population and we start methodically thinking about moving outward in the cosmos. And, and you know, there are over 100,000 galaxies and our galaxy has a planet that sustains life. I'm pretty sure there are at least 10 other planets out there that sustain life, and I'm pretty sure there are at least 10 other planets out there that sustain life are saying, oh, fuck, what are we gonna do when Earth gets its shit together? Okay, uh, so it, it, I, I think we're at the very beginning of a very exciting time. I am actually not worried about population growth because I'm pretty sure that if we give every poor person a free cell phone and, and free access to education one call at a time, they're gonna figure out the math better than we will. Hi, I'm, I spent uh, some time in the, in the military, in, in the Navy, and I really need something. I went to, uh, for instance, a Coast Guard base. And I was talking to some, well, actually, I wasn't even talking. I was over here in a conversation about somebody whining how they had to go, like, you know, we're going out to sea for the weekend, and it's <laughs> terrible, and we're Coast Guard, and oh my God, I won't be back in time for Monday for my boyfriend. But the role of the Coast Guard has expanded dramatically um, over probably the last 10 or 15 years or so. Uh, to the point of guarding our coast to actually invading other countries or uh, enforcing our drug enforcement policy or um, yeah. circum circumceding uh, or circumventing or um, how do I want to say it? Uh, 
hitting other vessels in international waters, for instance, and with permission from their countries, of course. <laughs> so, so how does that really, you know, how do you feel about that? And well, I, I will tell you the same thing I would tell the CNO: you fucked up. Uh, because if the U.S. Navy had taken literal and expeditionary warfare seriously from the time that I did the expeditionary study, I was the study director. I founded the Marine Corps Intelligence Command as the senior civilian, and we did a study on planning and programming factors for expeditionary operations in the third world. And the first thing we told the U.S. Navy was, you got to be able to do your shit in under five fathoms. Um, and the U.S. Navy wanted nothing to do with it. I absolutely fried several 06s in the Navy when I told them that we're going to be down to 10 carriers by uh, 2000. I mean, they wanted me fired. Um, now, having said that, I think that a shallow water Navy is a very important thing. I've actually done the, the plan for a 450 ship Navy, which you'll find at Phi Beta Iota, and it increases amphibious to from 9% to 11%, it increases. Uh, brown water up to 31 percent. Um, part of the problem that we have is that the U.S. Navy stinks or doesn't want to do shallow water, brown water, littoral warfare. And the Coast Guard desperately wants deep water stuff. Um, and it also turns out you've got to be able to interdict further out. So from where I sit, and oh by the way the Navy, I don't know what the Navy was thinking, but they now have uh, fire systems on ships that cannot be reloaded at sea, um, which has always been one of our strengths. And they also are outgunned by coastal artillery around the world. And I identified that as a problem in 1988. And the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Jones, decided not to fight the CNO for naval gunfire for the Marines. And several Commandants in a row decided to agree on 1,000 Marine ships that are a subskipper's dream. Um, so bottom line here is the U.S. government is simply not serious. And, and part of the problem here is the Office of Management and Budget. They stopped doing management in the 1970s. And so there's no adult in Washington that will talk to the departments or to the CNO or to whoever and say, hey, we not only have to do ports, we have to be able to do brown water, we have to be able to take, I, I coined, um, the term expediter because it fits between destroyer and frigate. Um, yeah, and and you know the Coast Guard totally hosed up naval acquisition, but then the Navy is no better. The Navy can't build a ship today. I, I commend to your attention the book on Andrew Jackson Higgins and the boat that won World War II. Uh, Andrew Jackson Higgins had to fight the Navy shipbuilding bureaucracy, and this man was able to design, build, and test a landing craft variant in a 24-hour cycle. He was turning out Liberty ships one per day in New Orleans using New Orleans citizens who had never before touched a welding rod. Um, so I guess my, my long answer to your question is we haven't done our homework. And worse than not doing our homework, there's nobody in Washington that is actually able to manage across departments and basically say, we're going to do planning and programming in this whole of government fashion. And oh, by the way, every airplane and every boat that is built is going to have a super RFID chip in it so that any airplane sold in Medellin, Colombia can be shot out of the sky whenever we want. Simple stuff. I mean, I got a thousand airplanes going over Guatemala and we're getting two a year. Um, I mean, we're just not thinking. Does, does that kind of answer your question I, I or think not? Maybe, I think maybe a little, little bit of clarification around when you say interdict farther out. Mm -hmm. um, did you mean like internet of, of international waters? Because yeah. my vision of the Coast Guard is that they're here to protect the international coast. I mean, I'm sorry, the United, United States coastline and not here to, to like float off the coast of Colombia and play like, you know, drug lord uh, oh, you're interdiction absolutely. or something like that. Yeah, you're, you're right. And, and part of the problem you have is that the FBI and, and DEA and the U.S. Navy sometimes are running drugs into the United States. I mean, I was told by the head of a special forces detail that he was assigned to guard Ole North when he was personally bringing a cocaine shipment into the U.S. And I honestly don't know the truth of the matter. But if you read uh, Dark Alliance, uh, Blandon was a Nicaraguan Contra 
who was bringing in strategic amounts of cocaine and selling them to Ricky Ross, who became a black multimillionaire because he was a really great entrepreneur and he was clearing two million bucks a day in small bills. Uh, and he's the one that got arrested and, and uh, went to jail. Blondon kept getting bailed out by the CIA. Um, so we have a government without integrity that protects drug lords uh, for reasons that are beyond comprehension. And at the same time, we have a Coast Guard, a Department of Homeland Security, everybody's after budget share. And the congressional committees are part of the problem because the congressional committees are using budget share as a way of allocating pork. And the going rate in Congress for re-election campaigns is 5% for every earmark delivered. Um, so bottom line is it comes back to integrity, 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 integrity. You're right, the Coast Guard should not be off the coast of uh, uh, Columbia, but the U.S. Navy refused that mission. I ghost wrote the article for the Commandant of the Marine Corps called uh, Intelligence Challenges of the 1990s. Uh, it was published in the American Intelligence Journal, and at the time I said the narcotics threat is a type threat. It is not a distraction from our primary mission. It is a type of unconventional, irregular threat that we must, as a military, be able to deal with. And the U.S. Navy said, stick it in your ear. We don't do drugs. Or we do drugs, but only if we get budget share allocations. So the problem is the system is not really being built to do missions. It's being built to keep contractors employed. And, and that is what's so bad about it. Uh, once again, I apologize if I'm repeating something. Go, go, go. I mean, uh, I, we could all probably agree that like Saddam Hussein as a, a totalitarian dictator probably wasn't a very nice guy to his people. Or We should never have invaded. Well, that's part of my question. Now, while he may have been gassing some of his own people and, you know, there, there were some nasty things going on, it seemed the, the country as a whole, th there wasn't like this complete and utter lack of like humanity basically there weren't people killing their own citizens it was was it really such a bad thing well I mean it was a bad thing for him doing it but did the ends justify the means because it seemed like they were getting not along but they weren't killing each other anyway. well yeah I mean he had created a secular state that had uh, essentially enforced peace between the Sunnis and the Shiites and and believe it or not nobody bothered to tell Dick Cheney and George Bush that the Shiites were in the majority um, and that they were allied with Iran. The problem in, in the whole Iraq thing is that Dick Cheney committed over 25 impeachable offenses and led the telling of 935 documented lies because the neocons wanted Iraq and they thought they could take Iraq at no cost and own the oil fields and basically shove the French and the Russians out of Iraq. Uh, I'm pretty sure Ahmed Chalabi was an Iranian agent of influence. Uh, he spoon-fed Cheney what Cheney wanted to hear. CIA did not have the balls to stand up to Cheney, and neither did Colin Powell. And so we allowed Dick Cheney to take this country to war on a web of lies. Is it a coincidence that it seems that all around Iran we have countries that have, at least militarily, we have interests in? I honestly don't know enough but I'm concerned that we're using American taxpayer money to subsidize arms sales to people that are not our friends. And uh, there's just no public interest that I can think of that calls for arming any Arab state, and certainly not Egypt. Uh, so all I can tell you is that we're out of control. Uh, political decisions are being made, and I think our flag officers have betrayed the American people by confusing loyalty with integrity. Uh, and um, just about any flag officer you care to name, with the exception of Tony Zinni, has betrayed the public interest. Thank you. Yes, sir. And if you didn't make flag, that says something good about your integrity. <laughs> now, on, this, on this question of betrayal, you know, every politician... Did this. Yeah, thank you. you. Start over. You talk about betrayal, and so there's... There are no politicians who, who have this integrity. Out of everyone who you know, is, is in our government, no one really is, uh, stands up for this I, I, I'm How happy to. Well, what hap I guess the question is, what happens to people when There they are two books on Congress. One is called uh, The Broken Branch, and the other one is called Betrayal of Trust. 
and I forget which one was written by Senator Coburn, but one of them has the subtitle of How Washington Turns Outsiders into Insiders. And it's basically fairly straightforward. Uh, your first year in Congress, you're a boot congressman, and the party leadership says, listen, Joe, here's the way it works around here. We vote on the party line. And if you vote on the party line, uh, you get the big office, you get the extra staff, uh, you get the TV coverage, and you get the, the prime committee assignments. If you don't vote on the party line, you won't win re-election. But, but, but hold on, isn't that really sick that our system operates that way where you have to have some kind of tenure in order to vote for what's right for your uh, Well, I mean, it, basically people with integrity would say, fuck you, and then they'd go public. But the reality is they don't. They, they go along with the system. I mean, look at... We, we, we got a guy who died. He was like, what, 93 in office? I mean, how many times do you think he was really awake for voting sessions? Or how much do you really think he voted that wasn't attributed to the fact that he had tenure in, in, in the system? Yeah, I mean, he also had line, staff that, that, that managed votes, and he had lobbyists uh, who were working without pay that's in sick. his office. Well, it is sick, but I'm not here to, to agree that it's the right thing to do. I'm just here to say that's how it is. Um, it, it seems like at least in, in America as a whole, uh, outside of like heavy political seasons, like four, four year elections, that th there's like a, a fair amount of apathy and little if any news coverage. But within the last few years, you have like the Colbert Report and uh, like <laughs> basically I love it. comedy based political shows where people like that that age of people that could not necessarily make a difference because they don't have the income, but... This is Congress, and the, this is the White House, and this is what they do. 18 uh, to yeah, you have yeah. 18 to 35 year old males basically watching a show that's entirely political based. Like, is that like a good thing that... No, you know, it, 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 I, I can't say, I cannot say. I mean, what, what I take encouragement from is the fact that there's somebody that's willing to sit through the fucking night and listen to me. Um, I mean, that's, maybe that's sick, too. But um, I really believe that truth has a power and that we've been sleepwalking. Um, and we're now in a crisis. Uh, and I think there are more people that are willing to listen to common sense, and there are more people that are willing to basically stand up and say, I'm not going to stand for this. And I think the congressional leaders are really getting off easy because if Nader, <clears throat> I'm gonna do this so it can be turned into a YouTube, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> if Ron Paul and Ralph Nader and Cynthia McKinney and Jackie Salit had their integrity up front and center, they would be coming together to demand the Electoral Reform Act of 2010 to be passed no later than the uh, 31st of August, even if it means having to recall Congress. The fact that they're not doing that tells me that they have sacrificed their integrity. Now, one of the things I learned in attending a transpartisan session is that all of the non-governmental organizations are extremely nervous about any break from the bipartisan system because it turns out they're heavily invested in staff relationships with Democrats and Republicans. And they're very fearful that, that independents coming into power would say, are you kidding me? We've been giving you $2 million a year to talk about the desirability of reusing sanitary napkins? That's a waste of the taxpayers' money. They're terrified of the bipartisan gravy train running because the bipartisan gravy train has basically bribed everybody to be part of the go along to get along system. Um, so it's, it, it's sick, but I think that Ralph Nader and Ron Paul or Jesse Ventura, you know, I mean, I can give Jesse Ventura a, a nonpartisan cabinet tomorrow. Within 90 days working with you guys and others, we could have a policy, actually I've already done it with others. We, we have very specific, if you go to Earth Intelligence, um, earth-intelligence.net, there's 52 questions and answers there. There isn't a senator or a congressman today or a cabinet secretary or an assistant to the president or the president or Biden himself 
who could sit down and write those 52 questions and answers. So I invite you to take a look at them. We could have a coalition cabinet up and running within 90 days. We could have a balanced budget within 180. Uh, actually, we could do both within 30. Uh, this is not for lack of brain power. This is for lack of integrity. Okay, so something completely unrelated to that. Um, now, like... In two minutes, I have to pee. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, okay, so maybe Vegas one brief. Now, <laughs> please. It, it seems like Republicans, Republicans in general have, um, while originally, you know, big business, small government, right. it seems like they've completely gone against that. Yes. It's, it's large government. It's still big business, but they, they've gotten, it seems like the poor and un, uneducated on their side. The two parties have morphed into each other. It's just two sides of the same coin, yes, basically, right? Yes, exactly. In fact, there's a wonderful graphic, same bird, uh, two wings, same bird. Uh, where am I going? That Oh, so as far as like the Tea Party is concerned, now, now it seems like the Republicans are really good at getting upper middle class people who, yeah. if anything, it, to me at least it seems like borderline racism because hi Hispanic, like at least not to stereotype, but some of the people that I know that are day laborers are like the hardest working people that I've ever met. And... It, it, it just seems like veiled racism. Are they just going after like this upper middle class because they well, I th I care think about that, this? That, no, the, the, the Tea Party is being captured. Um, I want to spend more time on this, so let me take a short break, and then let's come back and talk about the whole art of political theater, because all of this is theater. Okay. None of this is real. You know, it's interesting. Ross Perot was almost a genius. Um, and I really, I had a, I still have a Perot for President sticker. But he lost it. I think his ego got in his way. Um, and when he fired his two political advisors, one from each party, uh, all the steam went out of him. Now, Jesse Ventura is not Ross Perot. Uh, I would support Jesse Ventura for president. Um, I'd support Sarah Palin for vice president. Um, Why? What? What? Why? Because she's a real person, is what you're saying. Yeah. She's thank you. Thank you. Because my 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 planned remark would have been grotesquely sexist, and um, you know, but but yes, yeah, she's a real person. Um, and I'll tell you something. I I mean. I know some of the people in Alaska that are close to her, and, and they actually really like her. Uh, she and her husband were members of the Alaskan Independence uh, Party. Um, and I personally think Alaska is being screwed by the United States of America. Uh, and there's, there's just a lot of issues here. But the bottom line here, let me put it in a different way. I'll support any of you for president of the United States or Vice President of the United States, or any cabinet position. Because all we need to get this country back on track is people with a brain willing to listen to other people and to be transparent and accountable. And you know, that's all it takes. It's a totally different subject. What do you think of South Park? South Park, what is that? <laughs> Never mind. OK. <laughs> <laughs> no, remember you were going to talk about the... You, you I, I, I will tell you, what is that, Spongebob? Or no, no, not Spongebob. Um, who's, what's, that, what's that crazy TV program with the guy that says all the politically incorrect things? It's a cartoon. No. Yes, The Simpsons. I'm sorry, but The Simpsons bear a striking resemblance to my family. <laughs> all right, yes, sir. I had a different question, but before you, before you left, you were going to talk about the struggle between the neocons and the Tea Party, and mm. it got interrupted, so please resume. Well, uh, part, of the, part of the problem is the, the, the Tea Party's being captured, and, and I think, I hope they realize it, but they may not. Just like Obama is theater, the Tea Party is theater. It's intended to give people a little bit of hope before they run into the electronic voting machines where everything's been rigged. Um, all of them. 
all of them. Someone very intelligent told me that Diebold was the best of the lot and they were simply stupid, not criminal. Um, you know, I personally think Diebold is criminal also because the Diebold president has said on, on the open mic that he will deliver the election. Um, but what we have here is those people who get organized. I mean, ACORN is a classic example. Uh, they get captured and they become corrupt. Uh, and what we don't have is a genuine citizens movement. Now, I think Jesse Ventura works some real magic in, in his state. Um, and Schwarzenegger has been good. I mean, the Australians are pissed off that he can't be president because they want him to be president so Austria can become the 52nd state. Um, <clears throat> but you know, all it takes is the ability to balance the truth in public. And that's why I'm so opposed to all of these secret deals. The Health Reform Act is, is all this obscure secret bullshit. I mean, in fact, in, in, in Europe, there's a copyright act that is being voted on and the members being voting on the act aren't being allowed to read the copyright provisions. What? Yeah, the UK. Um, they're not being allowed to read all of the provisions and a lot of the WTO and IMF stuff is secret. And so all of these triggers back and forth, you know, are, are secret. Um, so I, I just, I, <laughs> I think that we're going to, we're going to have to get to, to a crash point where people simply realize that the Republican and Democratic parties are evil, um, that their leadership cannot be trusted, that they do not represent the public interest, and that we would be much better off basically going with no party um, and electing people whom we tell. Uh, there's a wonderful book called Tyrannicide, where congressmen start dying. Uh, <laughs> Imagine that. Okay. Um, and not accidentally. Uh, I'll tell you what, if, if three congressmen in a row die in this Congress, you're going to see a lot of shit pants being sent to the cleaners. Uh, because if three congressmen in a row die, that's not an accident. Uh, and I think there's a, spontane there's a spontaneous anger in America. I used to give speeches for the American Council on Foreign Relations and I visited 19 cities across America and I was absolutely stunned at the upper middle class anger at the incapacity and lack of integrity of the federal government. Uh, there is, I mean, Americans are not fools. They know they're being screwed, but they feel powerless. And, and so I think we're, we're waiting for this magic moment when all of a sudden everybody realized we don't have to put up with this shit anymore. Fire the asshole and tell the new asshole that if he votes party line, we will recall his ass within a week. Forget okay. that cool. huh? Forget that corner office. A, I would much rather keep my integrity and have the affection and respect of my community than have that larger office. But these guys are seeing it in a different way. Cool, glad to hear that. If I may, uh, my name is Lou, otherwise known as Smoke. Uh, two years ago and two years before that, I gave speeches here at the HOPE conference, kind of sort of a two-part speech. Uh, half the speech involved designing and implementing an electronic, inf uh, electronic voting infrastructure that allowed the people to directly select and elect whatever business, or whatever civic business, that they can conduct through the government directly, okay? The other part of that involved replacing the current two-party system <coughs> with a direct election infrastructure. I'm still actually working on that project. I'm actually more working on the technical aspects of that involving using a hardware codified cryptography subsystem resembling and depending upon a trusted platform module uh, to implement that design. As I said, it's a work in progress right now. But my question is this. In your opinion, based on your experience with government as it has been for God knows how long now, what do you think it would take to replace this dual party system that has served, <coughs> succeeded, and failed this country for the past 200 years with a system of direct democracy. Okay. 
that can be securely and verifiably implemented? I'm going to try and get to two Sorry slides. Sorry for the big question. No, no, it's a great question. It's an absolutely great question. Um, and, okay. And uh, what I want to try and do is, is figure out this computer. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Show me a screen. You're amazing. Pick up a copy of each book on your way out. All right. No charge. Uh, <laughs> except for me. Um, let me go back to the briefing that I... Um, that I gave earlier because I want to show you one slide. I hired Joe Trippi um, for a little bit and I really respect Joe Trippi and we put together something that I'm not sure I can show it to you right now but I'll show you something uh, sort of part of it. Um, let's see, conferences, hope, 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 2010 with t-shirt. <clears throat> That's not what I wanted to do. Uh, view, slide sorter. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> now let's see, view, slide, show. Let me go forward. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Trippy and I came together. I was very impressed by what Joe Trippy did for, for Howard Dean, who, by the way, has broken with the Democratic Party. Um, and we came to the conclusion that what was missing from the Trippy Dean initiative the first time around was budget numbers and policy substance. And so we came up with this, and the whole idea here is that for every line in the budget, there should be a one-pager that explains it. And there should be a place where there can be a moderated public discussion of each issue in each agency with a spreadsheet of the U.S. budget. And you should be able to compare alternative proposals line by line. Now, the Republicans and Democrats don't want you to do that because they actually don't have this. Okay, they basically just throw money around and magic happens here and they get their 5% and the contractors get their 95% and we get screwed. Um, but I don't know how many of you have seen the national budget simulation that's online. Okay, that's a pretty good piece of work and it could be made better. But there's no reason why we can't get to today immediately my budget at the national level, at the state level, at the county level, at the municipality level. And the only thing you have to do in, a, in doing my budget is identify yourself by zip code and by party preference. And out of 65 parties, not the two. Uh, and then all of the greens in a zip code would have their budget aggregated. And all of the libertarians and all of the republicans and so forth. This then allows a deliberative dialogue to take place in which you can actually discuss trade-offs, okay? So I don't think we're very far from the vision that you have. And I'm sorry I can't show you the other slide because I'm not sure how fast I can reach it, but I have another slide. It's worth looking for on Phi Beta Iota. It's a slide in which we self-fund the political process. And we basically put all of the political action things out of business. And we actually uh, contribute only to a generic thing which will fund any candidate at any level up to X. And of course, public free airtime and uh, no 527s or whatever they're called. All right, we're getting very close to a point where we can actually do this. And we can do it first at the county level, then at the state level, then at the national level. But I was actually thinking more of the local level. <clears throat> um, I've actually been tinkering with the notion of myself, for example, of running for mayor for a small community, for example. Sheriff. No, no, sheriff not sheriff. Style. It, it, it's not a question of implementing the current law. It would be a question of reforming the law, starting on a local level and simply beginning a direct 
beginning to implement and build a direct democracy infrastructure like what is common in Switzerland, for example, it, uh, where yes. the people meet at a, on a regular basis and <clears throat> conduct their <throat> civic business all together in one shot and to actually go beyond that. This, um, it's a very good model. And, and I agree with you. My one reservation is that I fear that local politics would be used to consume the reformers and keep them from national reform. Uh, so I have absolutely zero. Maybe that's okay. Start there. I, I am not a politician, and I have no, no real. Um, With one brief exception, neither am I. As I said, I'm more interested in the technological end at the moment, OK? <clears throat> Meaning that the technological end would be so that people can conduct their civic business over a securable and verifiable internet connection <clears throat> that does not exist at this time. I intend to build this so that it can be, con um, that everything can be verified and attested remotely using a TPM chipset or TPM-like so that everything can be verified in an open source manner. Well, in, in I'm open, with you, but it has to manner. be it has to be based on a cell phone, not a laptop, and you have to make sure that everyone who's eligible to vote either has a cell phone or has access to like a public library place where to they can. To expound further yeah. upon that option, I was thinking more like a live CD with a USB dongle, where the dongle held the TPM chipset. Gosh, that was exciting. Okay. As I said, I mean, it's a work watch in progress. My eyes glaze over. Uh, right. I, I would say make that a birds of a feather session, um, and let's yeah. move on, uh, because I don't As I think said, there's I'm any, working on. It. I, yeah, I hope there's to nothing have, constructive I can I, do. I hope to have something concrete within the next year. No, that'd be great, uh, ma'am. What do you think of the militarization of our police, their exercises with foreign troops on our soil, and the disregard for posse comitatus? Well, um, first off. The police aren't covered by posse comitatus. Uh, I'm not sure about foreign troops. Uh, but I am very, very concerned about rumors that I've heard about FEMA talking to various police departments, notably the Los Angeles Police Department, about the federalization of all state polices. Um, that is a crime waiting to happen. and. Um, I'm very pleased that some sheriffs refuse to enforce eviction orders. I think we need to really look deeply. And again, this is part of scrubbing Congress. We really need to look deeply. I mean, the federal government is out of control. I've said this many times. It is out of control. And I'm very concerned about the combination of men without a country in, in certain places in Arkansas and Washington state uh, there are military compounds that are unmarked, uh, that have people with no passports who are armed who would be quite happy to kill U.S. citizens. Uh, we have uh, U.S. military people being handpicked because they answer yes to the question, would you be willing to disarm Americans? Um, and I think we're, we're treading on very thin ice in this area. Uh, I'm also very concerned about all of the Halliburton detention facilities. Uh, one of the reasons I want to legalize marijuana and release everybody that's been put in prison uh, for marijuana is because that will give me a whole bunch of pissed off guys that know how to fight. Uh, and, um, and I think we really, really have to seriously contemplate the possibility that the federal government is our enemy. And I don't mean the good people working for the federal government. I mean the really bad people managing the federal government. And uh, I am not here to cast stones, and I'm not here to say reject your government. I'm here to say your government's lost its mind, and we really need to figure out how to get a grip. Yes, ma'am. Have you heard of Oath Keepers? Oath Keepers, uh, no. Oh, you want to tell us about it? coalition of law enforcement and military who are uh, re-swearing their oath to the Constitution mm. as opposed to the chain of command as you've been referring well, to. Well, that's, that's excellent. I'm also very pleased with the citizen's um, jury rights manual. You know, juries not only have the right to clear anybody, they also have a right to overturn the law upon which yes. the accusation was based. 
And it's time we started enforcing that well, right. And part of the problem with that is not the idea, but the discipline that's being, uh, even if it's social discipline being put upon the people who are in positions of authority who join Oath Keepers or <coughs> ascribe to talking about that. Mm -hmm. so, it's, yeah, so it's something that exists that's growing, but it's frowned heavily upon by the actual establishment. I love it. Uh, I would be very pleased if you sent me something that would help me post something on Oath Keepers. Uh, I think the Constitution is a very valuable document. I think we're long overdue for a constitutional convention. Um, and I think it's time we got into the 21st century, and I would love to see a constitutional convention. Yes, sir. Oh, are, are, uh, f finish your statement. I'll no, I'm done. You're done? Okay. We have a driver, yeah. and whatever, and, and Whatever you need to keep going, just let me know. And if you want to quit, that's of course that's okay. No, but I'm not. I'm not quitting. Um, I'll be here as long as this group wants me here. But I have to stop at ten, and I'd rather stop at eight. Uh, if you guys want to go for the all-time record, so if I get a bullet in my chest. Okay, let, let's let's. What eight? You really think you can handle eight? Let let's let, let me let's take a quick. Do you mind if I take a quick audience poll? How many people, if he is willing to do so, would stay here until the next talk at 10 a.m.? Round no, of applause. No, 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 no. Bad. Okay. Bad. Eight. Okay. Eight it's, is a nice round figure. How many people? It, would eight be an all-time record? Oh, absolutely. It'd be double the all-time record. Well, no, just for the record, we now are at an hour and 45 over the last year's record. Mm. How many people want him to go until 8 a.m.? Round of applause. All right, all right. Now that means you guys got to keep feeding him questions until then. Yes, thank you. Thank okay, you. and then let me know if there's anything else you need. I'll, I'll keep checking no, up here. No, and, and, and although I'll consider the driver, I generally like to drive myself because I pee a lot between here and Virginia. <laughs> Get your job. And I want to control where and when. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll, we'll keep staff here until 8. Guys, like, keep, round of applause. Energy, right. energy. Right. energy. Get them going until 8. But if someone needs a ride to Virginia, leaving at 8.15, it's possible I would consider that. Um, so because I have to put books in the back seat. Uh, Thank you. OK. Uh, go on, sir, please. Uh, back to the um, direct democracy. What stops the 51% that's easily influenced, let's say, uh, the poor being convinced that uh, a death tax or an estate tax is in their best interest to get rid of it? from raping the rights of the other 49%. I, I, all I can say is that I think education has been very much abused. And um, the whole issue of propaganda, I mean, propaganda actually means to propagate an idea. It doesn't mean to manipulate the truth. Um, and it's, it's the conflict of visions and the conflict of interests. I don't have all the answers, but I do believe that if everybody is engaged, they're offsetting balances. Um, and uh, I really recommend this, this book, Non-Zero Sum, because the point he makes is that it's not win-lose, it's win-win or lose-lose. And that's a really cool point. Um, so again, it comes back to community. It comes back to understanding that, that we can't survive without one another. Um, and I have no real answer that's definitive other than to say, I think we're at a point now where the poor have the most to gain by being smart. Um, I was gonna answer that question partially myself, at least. I, there's, you're right, there's no fast definitive answer. Uh, if anyone would decide to read the Federalist Papers, for example, James Madison and a lot of the other early adopters of the original Constitution uh, gave various warnings about that particular situation. That would depend in large part on the structure that would be implemented as well as the improvements that can be made thereafter. So as, I, as he just said, there's really no hard and fast answer, but the Federalist Papers that were written 200 years ago would be a good place to start. Yeah, and, and the tyranny of the minority is very good. I mean, what I like is the Native American principle, which basically is what we're doing here, is nobody leaves until we agree. Uh, 
And it's remarkable how that brings in consensus because the, the, the filibuster of the individual actually leads to, I mean, I was very impressed in Denmark. I completely lost my cool with, with this black guy who thought Lincoln was a savior, had no idea that Lincoln did the Emancipation Proclamation just as military necessity and it only applied to those in the South, did not apply to the North and the West. And, and he had no clue that the South had been carpetbagged for 12 years after the war. Um, and so I got very angry at him. But in the process of getting angry at him, which I realized I should never ever do again, I saw the remarkable integrity of the Dan Danish people. They have learned how to talk without getting angry. And they have learned how to lay out extremely important complex things and how to disagree. And that frankly has never been my strength. Um, well, but intelligent nonviolent communication. And I mean, I almost have a churning in my stomach now as I realize how much I failed, but how much they've succeeded. I mean, the whole Danish uh, Tom Atlee, who, whose books I recommend, uh, Co-Intelligence, uh, Creating a World that Works for All, and his more recent book, uh, Reflections on Evolution or Evolutionary Activism. Um, Tom is the one who introduced me to the whole idea of the Danish Citizens uh, Wisdom Council. I mean, when the Danes want to consider something like uh, whether they should import genetically uh, altered corn, they pick 12 Danish citizens whose only qualification is that they know nothing about the subject. And then they have the status of a Supreme Court. They can call witnesses, they can interrogate people, they can subpoena documents. And at the end of it, these 12 people decide on behalf of Denmark and that's the way it's going to be. I mean, that's really cool. Uh, and I really want to emphasize the fact that the 12 people are chosen for lack of knowledge about the topic and for their common sense. That's what Plato said. Really? Wasn't Plato's uh, Republic all about the, 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 the person who least uh, qualified for the job should be the one who has it in government? Well, that, that makes a lot of sense uh, in some ways. Unfortunately. Right, but, but instead what we have now is the least qualified in the job who want the job uh, and, and make a hash of it. Uh, so, all right, sir. So actually, that, that kind of tied into what I was going to ask a little bit better than I was, what I was expecting. Uh, I guess one of the things that's been going on in the back of my head for a, little, for a while is if, if we got rid of all of the politicians, got rid of, stopped making professional lawyers and professional politicians, replaced all of the politicians with engineers, and Ooh, had <laughs> even worse. <laughs> and, 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 but the engineers were, still had to hold themselves to their code of ethics. And they, they still had to go There's in there an and, engineering code of ethics? There, there are several. Break it all. <laughs> you have to exit the system to actually develop it. Okay. Uh, he said that you have to exit the system to actually develop it. Okay. Keep going. So, so if, you, if you replace all of these professional lawyers, um, people who are going to school to become politicians, with engineers who go to school to do things methodically, logically, get things done and not worry about you know, trivial things that don't actually matter and focus on what's important, do you think that that would be a, a, a change that could potentially work in an ideal world where it might actually happen uh, as opposed to the well, world that we live in? Well, you know, Joe Fox from IBM wrote a book, and I forget the title. It might have been about quality. But he said the opposite of virtue is not vice. It's virtue carried to an extreme. And one of the things that I think is bad in any system is a... Um, mono poly. In other words, the only thing worse than all politicians is all everything else. Uh, so I would never want all engineers. I'd want, I mean, uh, E.O. Wilson wrote a book called Consilience, which answers the question, why do the sciences need the humanities? Yes, it is. And it's one of the toughest books I've ever read, and it's absolutely the most intelligent footnotes I've ever read. I mean, this is one of those books where I start with the index, go on to the footnotes, and then read the book. Um, I think it's actually one of about three that I've had to read that way. Um, so it's not about all engineers. It's about diversity, clarity, integrity. And it's about making sure that every voice is heard. I mean, there's a wonderful literature emerging on voices lost. 
we have sacrificed so much in our repression of the ind indigenous people, including centuries worth of learning and centuries worth of experience. Um, and also, I'm, I don't want to get too far carried away with this, but engineers lack soul. Uh, ego. Uh, yeah, also, ego, way too big. Way too big. And, and, and so, you know, the rational methodical is not always the best way to get someplace. Uh, it may be that you need a little bit of lunacy and a little bit of humanity and, and, and so forth. Um, do we have sheep in the audience? Is that, a, is that like a sheep having an orgasm or? <laughs> well, the sane ones can move forward. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. So I guess I had, I had one other question, um, which is related a lot to education. Uh, and I guess something that I've seen recently, at least with my college education, things that I've been going through, is that it, it seems like the current political environment, um, which is the term that other people are using to describe a particular situation, has had a negative impact on the creativity that, that students are allowed to express. And, and I'm wondering if you see that, and if you see any resolution to that in the near future. We've, we've really blown it. I mean, we're so focused on credentialing We've completely dismissed learning. And uh, there are a number of books. I think I've got over 80 books in my education category at, at Phi Beta Iota. I mean, among the books that have really impressed me are Orbiting the Giant Hairball and Weapons of Mass Instruction. I just recently reviewed a book on why students don't like school. Um, there's just a bunch of them. And unfortunately, I think we have learned to manage ourselves to the lowest common denominator. Uh, and we, we tend to focus on the 20% worst and the 20% best, and then we kind of just like leave the middle alone. We, we are totally off base with respect to rote learning. Um, I mean, we have a 1950 school system, uh, and we don't do team learning, we don't do learning to learn. Uh, we don't do enough hands-on. Uh, we we um, we don't use the huh? Outdoors. Yeah, outdoors. Absolutely. Uh, uh, we've we've sacrificed art and music, and it turns out art and music help you think better. Uh, we've sacrificed physical education, cultural studies. We've bastardized college. I mean, everything from feminazis to to. Uh, culture of the black lesbian uh, one-legged doo-doo, you know? I mean, it's just, come on. Uh, liberal arts should be about learning to think, and, and it shouldn't be about forcing specific little things in there. Uh, so education is hosed, and I really go with Plato's comment, which Will Durant brought to my attention, which is the single most important role of any organization is to teach and to educate and to, to create organizational intelligence. I, I guess.